Thank you all for giving uh, me the opportunity to present this work. Um, it's a privilege. So um, yeah, my name is Elizabeth Campbell and I'm at Rockefeller University. And what I'll talk about today is a collaboration between um, our labs and Ryan Chates and Subun Kapoor uh, groups. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the HeLa case from SARS-CoV-2 couples with a replication transcription complex. And this is a, using a structural approach. This is part one of um, part two talk, so uh, uh, bear, bear with us there. <laughs> so I'll give you a little bit of a background. <clears throat> we study bacterial DNA dependent RNA polymerase and you know we've made a partial transition now to studying the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And it, we got to this um, because we know a lot from decades of biochemistry and structural biology how the DNA RNA polymerases work. We understand how the inhibitors work and which steps are targeted. And we wonder whether we can apply some of these approaches towards um, understanding SARS-CoV-2 replication transcription. Um, this work was really, uh, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting was done by two of our graduate students, Brandon Malone and James Chen, who um, with a lot of help from a research assistant, Eliza, really you know, drove this project. Um, this is one of our midnight Zoom sessions during the pandemic where we were really trying to brainstorm and, and, and really trying to learn more about SARS-CoV-2. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV um, coronaviruses are basically uh, come and fall under the order of nidoviruses. And I'm showing you this tree just because I, I do want to mention the nidoviruses are special in that they are they have a specific order of how the replication proteins are organized in this polycystronic conformation. It's a positive strand genome. And they also have this very peculiar feature that only the nidoviruses have where they produce um, subgenomic uh, RNA. Again, one of the reasons for showing you this tree is SARS-CoV is considered a beta coronavirus, but a lot of the genetics, biochemistry, and what, a lot of what we know about the replication proteins are actually, were actually done in the arteriovirus. Um, it's a smaller, more tractable uh, version of the native viruses, missing some of the, um, some of the proteins. But a, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, we have to refer to the arteriovirus biology for this. So this is a SARS-CoV-2 genome. It's uh, approximately 30 kilobases in length. And shown in the three prime end of it are the, the genes in red. They're basically the structural proteins. They form, form the envelope of the virus. But we're going to focus today on the ORF1A and ORF1Bs that produce about 60 non-structural proteins. And specifically, we're going to talk about the ones here that um, are directly involved in nucleic acid processing. So the central player in the transcription replication process is the polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is called the RDRP. You'll hear me use that term. And it's assisted by two cofactors, NSP7 and NSP8, um, that are found over here. And they form what's called a hollow RDRP enzyme. So um, the, next, the next player that I'm going to focus on is the helicase, also called NSP13. And a lot of structural biology has been done in, first in the arterivirus, MERS, SARS-CoV-1. And then the other three proteins that are important in this um, in, in, in replication and transcription and, and that we know have direct nucleic acid uh, activity, nucleic acid processing activities are, are the exonuclease and the ribonuclease and then uh, metal transferases for modifying the RNA. So these likely form sub, sub large complexes to work on replication transcription at some point of, of you know, of, during these processes, both replication and transcription and subgenomic transcription. So we, they do know, like again, the genetics in the arteriovirus and some confirmed in, in coronaviruses is that the polymerase and the helicase are absolutely essential for the virus to replicate. These other proteins, um, they, they cripple the virus for so efficient replication is, is, uh, is not no longer possible when mutations are done here. And then as I mentioned, this virus is a uh, very curious thing called subgenomic transcription, which uh, Seth will talk about a little bit more later on. So the focus today is on the helicase and its interactions with a hollow RDRP. And so when, when I started this uh, work, I, I checked in with Charlie Rice to see, you know, were we just being, you know, very naive going into this? And I asked Charlie, what's the role of the helicase in, in, in replication in viruses? And, 
he basically said that it's not clear <laughs> and you know anything would be helpful so th that sort of inspired us to go forward with our studies in trying to get structures to understand perhaps how the uh, Healy case may assist in these processes. So the questions we're asking, uh, you know, that, that I asked Charlie was, does the hollow RDRP interact with the Gila case, right? That's the first question. Does, is there a stable interaction? And if so, how? And if so, then can it tell us what the, the roles are in replication and transcription? And then again, hopefully, hopefully anything could be useful for developing new antivirals. So that's what Charlie actually looks like. Um, so, and Anyway, so the, the RDRP, one of the more obvious functions that the RDRP would have is to unravel the secondary structure, right, in the RNA, in the genome. So RNA, as we know, tends to form very highly structured, um, sec, you know, these hairpins, et cetera. And they have done probing before in the beta covies and they, sh they predicted and also tested that it is very structured. And then more, more recently, Anna, Anna Marie Powell's group, has really confirmed this in, in beta clone viruses too, that it's even more structured than we, we thought. You know, these are just subregions. So the HeLa case might play a role in basically unraveling this so that the polymerase can access these bases for templated transcription. I'm gonna just introduce you quickly um, to what the the what I mean when I say the replication transcription complex. So you're gonna hear me use the word RTC a lot, and it's we call it a replication transcription complex. It's the same complex doing replication and transcription. And this is the, the central player. This is the RDRP, the polymerase. And the viral polymerases have this uh, this fold of like a right hand where the periwinkle is showing a thumb, the fingers are shown in blue and the active site residues, mo most of them are in the palm domain here, and the RNA would sit here. The, the needle viruses actually have this unusual, um, these two unusual domains, the NIRAN and the interface domains that are not found in other viral polymerases. This is actually a genetic marker for uh, needle viruses, and their functions are not known. Um, so the cofactors that I spoke about earlier are NSP8. There are two copies of NSP8 that binds to the hollow RDRP and one NSP7. And the, these two um, references here, CBC and Kirchhofer, basically showed that they are they bind to make a good stable complex of hollow RDRP, RDRP. And CBC showed that they were important for um, transcription and processivity. So more recently, Patrick Kramer's group had a structure with the, the RNA. And while these are not ordered in the structures without RNA, they become very well ordered and very visible because as you can see here, they bind the RNA and they likely stabilize each other. So it explains the basis of these cofactors and the active site is here. So again, to remind you, this is the RTC, right? It has the RNA, it has the, um, the cofactors and it has the RDRP. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the HeLa cases, right? Um, so what was the evidence that HeLa, the HeLa case might bind RTC? So there was preliminary evidence. Again, um, my uh, Isabel Embert's group is here. They did pull downs with NSP8, and they found that it bound a wide variety of factors, including NSP13. And two hybrid studies actually show that NSP8 is also an epicenter. It, they, they bind a bunch of other different proteins. So that was, you know, NSP8 is part of the RTC, so that was encouraging uh, data, you know, saying that there likely is a complex. So our group, what they did was they purified each of the components, and um, we're just showing you here the, the purification, um, the final steps, the gel filtration columns, and then they tested that each component was active by doing transcription act, uh, activity, uh, act assays and they show the enzyme, the RDRP, hollow RDRP was active. And then Tarun Kapoor's group uh, basically um, did all the work with it, showing that NSP13, the HeLa case, was active by doing ATP assays. And then this is important uh, later on for the talk in that we, in, for using the bacteria, for studying bacteria polymerases, we have found on cryo, in cryo-EM grids that we need a detergent chapso in order to help the particles behave properly and to get good orientation. So anticipating that, we also tested that the, the, the enzymes were active with chapso, and they were. So Eliza did um, a gel shift assay, just a very old fashioned simple assay here, where she took the RTC, so here you're seeing the hollow RDRP with RNA, and then she added um, NSP13, 
and she saw a shift. So that shift indicates that there are complex, a larger complex was being formed. And then when she added the um, ATP analog, ATP aluminum fluoride, she saw um, that the band intensified, which, which for structural biologists is a really good thing because it means that perhaps there's less motion, the complex is more stable. So we're, we're gonna proceed with studies with ATP aluminum fluoride. Um, Dom in Brian Chait's lab confirmed that this complex that we're seeing actually contained NSP13. So this was, uh, you know, this is, was very good for us, encouraging for us to go ahead and do structural studies. And Patrick Shelton in Tunkpur's lab showed that the ADP aluminum fluoride was inhibiting NSP13, meaning it's like it, it was binding NSP13 and that's likely what's causing this intensification. So we prepare our grids by combining we, we, we assemble our RTC on, on, a gel, on a size exclusion column, and then we added a helicase and aluminum fluoride. We did grids with or without chaps. So, and the final structure I'm gonna to talk to you about today is um, actually, it's, it's a nominal resolution of three and a half angstroms. And this is when I talk about the, um, the RTC structure with the helicase, this is what I'll be talking about. I'd like to give a shout out to the folks at NYSBC who really are, you know, at the cutting edge of uh, cryo-EM uh, data collection and, and they collected this data for us during the um, pandemic. So I'm going to take a little bit of a side road here before I get into the helicase interactions. And, you know, as I said, hopefully these structures are helpful for antivirals. So we were looking, you know, at, are there druggable ho holes in the, in the RTC that we can take advantage of. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the NIRAN before I come back to the Gila case. So that NIRAN domain, that domain that I told you is a genetic marker. Um, Alex Gorbelena basically uh, defined this domain and, and what it does. And it's called a NIRAN because it has a nucle nucleotidal transferase activity. It actually has a, I call it a cell nucle nucleotidal transferase activity. And what they did um, was first they did bioinformatics and showed that although it was ubiquitous in the neuroviruses, it's actually not well conserved. They struggled to find sequence conservation. But what they did show was that in a very nucleotide specific way, the NIRAN gets self nucleotidylated with AGTP and UTP. This was done in the arterial virus EAV. So we actually don't know what the substrate is in CoV-2 and we don't know if this even happens in CoV-2. As I mentioned, the sequence is low and we've done some preliminary work and we haven't been able to see this activity yet. Granted, we haven't put that much into it. So um, what we saw in our structures, and I'll get into the helicase just now, but the, this is the NIRAN, and we were surprised that, well, not surprised, but I guess we weren't looking for it, is that ADP was bound in the cavity um, of NIRAN, where nucleotide was predicted to bind based on the work I just showed you with arterial virus. And it was very clear density, so we can eas easily tell which amino acids were interacting with the base. And if you, if you run what's called a DALI search, where you basically take your 3D structure and you run it against a database of about a 3D structures looking for things similar in tertiary fold, it came across um, these pseudokinases, a family of pseudokinases. So just quickly, pseudokinases, they look like kinases, but they're often missing a lot of the catalytic residue, so they don't transfer gamma phosphate like a regular kinase would. And this family actually does something different. They, it transfers an, an AMP. It's called ampelation, but I guess you can call it nucleotidylation just more specifically. So it transfers a serine, threonine, or tyrosine hydroxyl. It'll transfer the, um, the, just the, the base and one phosphate. So why am I telling you this? It's because the NIRAN domain, as I said, looks like these pseudokinases. And what's interesting about these pseudokinases as well too is the NTP is, is flipped. So you just flip it over and, and that would be a kinase. And so we see the same sort of relative orientation is the same. The base, the amino acids interacting with the nucleotide, they're conserved. So in, uh, in cyan is our NIRAN structure and in orange is the cell O pseudokinase structure. And then highlighted here in, in, in these dot, in these bullets here are bases that are conserved between cell O and the NIRAN domain. And what I've done here is just also highlighted um, the group that did the work in the, the nidovirus, Gorbelinus group, they actually mutated these, uh, these amino acids. And when they do that, the virus can't, it's crippled in replication. So they basically showed the NIRAN was important, essential for uh, good viral replication. Interestingly, there are amino acids that are not conserved between the EAV nidovirus that appear to be, you know, interacting with the, 
the base here, uh, well, the phosphates. And, um, but they are conserving cell O, and I don't know if that speaks to substrate specificity, because what's bound here is an ADP, but according to the, e, the work in the viruses, the substrate is actually G or U. So questions are right that we still don't know right now is what's the substrate NTP? Um, what is the target for the nucleotidal transfer activity? Is it RNA? Is it protein? Is there a target? <laughs> or is it self-regulation? And um, do we even get this same thing happening with the SARS-CoV-2 NIRAN? Right, um, now we'll talk about the uh, NSP, the helicases. <laughs> So just a really quick reminder, helicases, they unwind or they can translocate on nucleic acids. There are six superfamilies. I'm gonna focus on the SF1 family, which is, tends to work as a monomer or dimer. And the, SF, the SF1 and SF2s tend to have inserts, like extra inserts that you know were in certain families. And these are important for interacting with other um, factors. So they're important for versatility and specificity. They all have an ATP binding and hydrolysis box, two boxes. And in the SF1 helicases, they are embedded in the rec like domains. So in terms of for the viral helicases, SF1 helicase is, is found in nidoviruses, herpes, and alphaviruses. And the directionality of the, vir of the helicase actually um, allows for the classification. So these are called SF1B helicases because they, they you know, of their, their, their structural motifs, but also because of their direction <clears throat> of unwinding or, or translocation. No one, as I mentioned, really knows their specific roles, their exact roles. And the ones that have been characterized have been done in arteriovirus and coronaviruses, at least up to, I, I'm having a hard time keeping up with my archives. <laughs> so, and the mutations have, it have established that they are important for viral replication. So uh, um, just to give you a little bit of, this is, a, this is our structure that I'm showing you. There are other structures well before ours of the SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and EAV helicase. But this is what we have, because, and I'm showing it to you because it has both an RNA substrate and it has a nucleotide, um, which I don't think has, has, there's a structure yet with both. So just to acquaint with you here, I'm gonna go through this movie. And first is gonna pop up is a zinc binding domain. That domain is another, the second genetic marker for nidoviruses. It's not found in other viral helicases. And it's called a zinc binding domain for obvious reasons, there are three zincs here. It's very cysteine, histidine rich. And then here you have a second, these are gonna be the rec domains are gonna pop up, right? The rec A domains. So there's rec A1 domain, I mentioned there are two. RecA2 is going to come up now in green, and then they form a pocket for the nucleotide that needs to be hydrolyzed to provide the energy for the translocation activity. This is the ADP, aluminum fluoride, we actually see in our structure. The helicase, an RNA is going to pop in now, a substrate. This was by accident that we saw this, but the helicase would be moving downwards where the arrow is. And we actually saw that, um, again, by accident, but we're happy. There are two extra domains that are found in this family of helicases, the stock and the 1B. And they're, you know, they're specific to the, this group of helicases. These are some of the specific domains I was talking about. They sort of form you know, uh, a wall to keep the, the substrate RNA in. All right. so. There are other structures that are related. There is a eukaryotic version of this helicase that has a zinc binding domain. It's the only one I know of in, in eukaryotes. And what's interesting is that zinc binding domain does move in the eukaryotes, in the eukaryotic version, depending on what partner is bound. The arteriovirus was done first, and it's similar, but not. It was hard to get an alignment actually. The one B and stocks are not that well conserved, and so it is possible the zinc binding domain moves, but. We, are, we don't have any evidence for that. Our structure is very similar to what was done in the crystal structures for both MERS and, and SARS. Um, I'm gonna just mention that for us at least, CHAPSO was really important when you collect the data without the detergent. Although you had a really nice you know, final resolution, <clears throat> the maps were not that great, especially around the helicase. You can see right around the orange and the red that it's very, you know, it's very disordered. And that's because the particles do not orient well in, in, on our grids without CHAPSO. So in other words, you're, you're seeing a biased view. If you add CHAPSO like we do for the bacterial polymerases, you get something of similar resolution. And I think this is important for the non-structural biologists. <laughs> the resolution isn't everything. You really need to look at the maps. 
And so the maps, you can just see more details and the maps, we, we, we could build it much, much better. Um, and this again is because we are getting a, a, a more um, a overall view of the, of the particles in, in on ice um, when you have the detergent present. So I'm gonna finish up now by telling you what the structure looks like and then um, Seth is gonna take it from there. So this is just a schematic. So this is our structure. We actually had classes with just one helicase, but they were minor. The major class that we solved had two helicases bound to one polymerase, uh, one to one RTC. So what I want you to notice here is the majority of the interactions with the RTC are happening with the zinc binding domain. There are, the, the helicases actually stabilize each other um, binding. Um, so they, they're making an interaction between the RECA domains and, and, the, and the, the 1B domain. And then lastly, as I mentioned, the five prime end of the template strand actually threaded through an NSP 13. We, we just made scaffold. There was no rationale for us really doing that other than to put extra nucleic acids in case the helicase needed something and it worked. Um, <clears throat> This is a view turned 90 degrees now, and what you, we are focusing on is NSP 13.1. So the interactions here, well, what I want you to note is that the helicase is actually on the downstream end of the active site. So the active site would be here, that, um, right where the thumb is, is, or the RNA is coming out here, and the helicase is sitting in front of the active site. NSP 13.1 is actually interacting with both NSP8 extension, the green, as well as a thumb of the RDRP. So that's one interaction. Second interaction we observe is with the head of NSP8B and NSP7. So this is in line with the studies I showed you, the biochemical studies I showed you before with the two Harvard studies and the pull down. And then, I don't know why that's so, sorry. And then the last interaction is with uh, the RNA that's threading through. So there were three separate interactions observed with 13.1. This is another view, and the, the only point for this view is to show you the, um, well, two things, the density, the difference density that this RNA, although it was very, you know, um, it wasn't well-defined, it was obvious if you, do, uh, if you do low resolution cutoffs. And so you can really see the path of it well. But in addition, we actually saw ADP aluminum fluoride bound in the active sites of the helicase. And, um, Lastly, this last view is to just show you that um, two things. One is how NSP132 interacts with the RTC. So that, that there's just one interaction. It's with the zinc binding domain and the second NSP8. And then we see ADP in the pocket. So I'm going to finish here. I'm going to play a movie and let you watch it. It's basically what I just showed you, but it's filling everything in. This is our, our, our map that we filled in our structures. So that's the RTC coming up. The two minute warning, okay? Oh, wonderful. This is uh, my second to last slide. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, the movie is just to give you a, a better overall view of, of the structures to see. I always find movies are helpful for g giving a 3D impression. And that's just the overall structure. And then I, I think I already went into the interactions. I'm just going to end now by telling you, you know, what we're, you know, what, what are some of the other questions we're hoping to answer. So going forward, where are we going now? Um, <laughs> so what are, what are the biological implications of the structure? And, and Seth is going to answer a lot of that uh, next. He's going to talk about these in the context of what I, you know, replication and, and transcription. Who else, for, who else is part of this complex and what is the a sequence of assembly? How are they coordinated? So there, there are lots and lots of questions and we keep coming up with more and more. But again, the shout out, I acknowledge everyone. I like, during our, our talk, I'd like to give a shout out to our funders and also um, the, a, a visiting scientist in Tantisha's lab actually cloned NSP-12. So as I mentioned, Seth is now going to give context to the structure. So, but I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, at least regarding up to what I've presented so far. Okay, That's it. Um, Liz, should we take questions now or after Seth? Um, if anyone has any questions, maybe on the Niran domain or on just the overall architecture, they 
they can, if they have any questions in terms of, you know, if, if, if there's anything about the biological implications, that, that should wait. But if, you, if there's anything specific about the, you know, just the structures, the architecture, or the NIRAN, please feel free to, yeah. Okay, so while people are getting ready to raise their hands, um, I'm gonna ask a question and it might lie at the interface between what you and Seth are going to talk about. So just, you can defer for a while if that's, okay. if that's of help. I wanted to know whether there's in vitro transcription activity plus and minus the HeLa case. Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> that's a really good question. So there is, and, um, and I, I probably know what you're thinking of. So one of the things that's striking, if you're paying attention to structure, is the HeLa case is moving in one direction, the polymerase in the other. And um, yeah, the HeLa case inhibits transcription of the polymerase. So that's it's the answer. Okay. It's inhibit because it's traveling along. The, so the helicase yeah, yeah. and the polymerase are traveling on the same strand in different directions, and so the helicase seems to win in this case. <laughs> and we're, we're yeah we're, we're we're trying to understand the, the as I said, Seth is going to talk about why he thinks that's important. Um, yeah, how how it might you know what, what roles it might be doing in 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 the cell or in the virus. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Another in our another. in vitro in our in vitro assays with that template that we use for the structure, if you give the helicase ATP, the helicase seems to win. So the polymerase can't elongate the primer, at least in that sort of in vitro situation. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, another question. Um, if I understood correctly, you can see the RNA in one of the two helicase subunits, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So we see one RNA threading through the first NSP13. Um, sorry, it's breaking up a little bit here. Um, basically, what I want to know is, is there a preference for which helicase the RNA sits in? Yes, so we only see it, at least, it's probably because of the orientation of, um, it's coming from the five prime end of the template trend, but we only see it in, in going into NSP13-1. And I think it's because it, it's spatially, that's it's preferred. The other helicase can, can bind. We actually have some sub data now showing that if you don't assemble the RTC and the size exclusion column, you know, just free RNA will bind the other helicase as well too. But because of the orientation of to the RTC, only NSP13-1 will bind the five prime, the, the template strand. Okay, perfect. Um, are there any additional questions for Liz? Well, I can ask a quickie, Elizabeth. So do we know what the zincs are doing? Are they just part of the protein-protein interaction or are they doing something? It, it looks like they're structural, and, and, but I, I don't, yeah. It doesn't, look, it doesn't look much more than it's a structural feature. Uh -huh. okay. But it could, who knows, maybe reg regulation is in there somewhere. 